I'll start with my usual disclaimer and a couple of less usual ones. The usual disclaimer is that uh, if there's mathematics in here, I will try to hide it carefully. Uh, the uh, slightly less usual disclaimer is uh, an apology for a title that looks very similar to something that I, I spoke on some years ago, so one or two of you in the audience may have seen. Um, I, I proved most of the results of this about six years ago and never submitted it because there was one case left that was terribly stubborn. Uh, and that case has now been resolved very recently, joined with, uh, with Sonderdam and Samir Siksa. So uh, the, the final disclaimer is that it's an odd subject in general. The question of integral points on elliptic curves is, is very model dependent. And you, can, you can make a reasonable argument that it's not a very natural thing to look at compared to, say, rational points or k-rational points. Uh, but there are some, some reasons one might be interested in them. You have, uh, you have at least uh, a connection, at least in one direction, to the rank of it curve that if you if you can actually bound that in families you bound uh, the number of integral points absolutely as well so so one has perhaps the the somewhat flimsy excuse that having some understanding of this might give you some understanding a little bit at least of perhaps whether whether or not to believe on this conjecture for example so uh, again the sort of very broad goal would be to understand say the number of size of little points are given model of the curve. And now here you might, if you're thinking of things being short via stress form, make a, a natural restriction that, that uh, the GCD of the coefficients is sixth power free, for example, to avoid the sort of nonsense you can get by, by scaling things to get all the other points you like. So quantifying uh, this sort of statement in general is, is, is pretty open. We don't really have a good uh, notion, even for instance, if you look at say Mordell curves with such a say make the k six power free, whether the number of integral points is unbounded or not. Po probably not, but it's a bit difficult to say. And we can find examples with a couple of hundred, so it's not, uh, not such a trivial case. So if you can't uh, say something generally, we'll try to say something even less general, and look within twists. And again, this is a case where over the years, I know when I was starting out, everybody thought Honda's conjecture was false. Presumably when Honda made it, he thought it was true. Uh, and then over time, this, the, the pendulum seems to swing back and forth. And I think many people now believe it's actually true. And that's, again, sort of a boundedness, uniform boundedness within families. And it does uh, actually follow from some conjectures of Blank and Brown, Mr. Pacelli. So again, I'll become increasingly less ambitious, and I'll end up less ambitious still than this. But if we look at, say, congruent number curve, so we have very special structure here. And we might want to try to actually understand, say, the heights of integral points, or, or uh, perhaps a little bit less ambitiously, the number of them on such a curve. And we can actually be still less ambitious there and restrict to a very, very simple case where we really are looking at uh, a fairly simple Diophantine equation. I'm going I'm to restrict to having essentially the, the, the least uh, bad reduction I can possibly have, basically by fixing a prime p, uh, say odd prime, and considering the case where we have a congruent number curve uh, with n of the form 2 to the a p to the b. And so this will lead by a very elementary arguments uh, by a descent to a number of different Diophantine equations. And what's, I think, quite interesting about this example is that it leads to stuff that's, that's really easy. It leads to stuff that's not so easy but classical. And then it leads to things that are, are actually quite hard. To, to treat. So, the, I mean, one of the other excuses I have for this was a question that uh, Henri Cohen asked me years ago about producing nice examples of, of curves where a priori there's no reason they're not to be integral points and there's infinitely many rational points. What can you say? Can you what can one say in general? So that was that was sort of underlying this, uh, at least when I first started working on this, which is probably 10 years ago. So again, uh, we're going to uh, we'll assume that the, the, the b exponent b here is odd. Otherwise, it's sort of a trivial case. And uh, I'll, pr I'll present you a few more excuses. So in this sort of case, there, there's there's a collection of papers looking at this at this kind of problem. And one of them, not too old, uh, gives you an algorithm for actually computing this. And I mean, of course, there's other there's other sort of ways to go about this. You can you can you can find the there's the, the standard algorithmic way to find integral points on a given model of an elliptic curve over Q at least 
is uh, is to go by a complex linear forms and complex logarithms. That's not what's coded in the magma or something like that. I don't really know why, uh, because what is coded in is elliptic logarithm, which, which isn't algorithmic and tends to have more drawbacks than the complex logarithm method anyway. But in any case, uh, they, they present a different way to go about this, but it involves working in sort of unit equations, and you've got to get this field data in this this bi-quadratic field. And they work they work this out in this particular case, and. And I looked at this and thought this just seemed kind of pointless. Uh, because really, you don't want to do this for a given prime p, because you'd like to do it for all primes simultaneously in some sense. And I guess the, the theme of today is that you really can. You don't have to do it for the prime p equals 3. So, and the other excuse again is that, is that underlying this by these sort of very elementary descents, you actually get some diophantic equations which are, which are interesting. I mean, uh, Actually, that's, a, that's a, a philosophical question in its own right. What makes a diophantic equation interesting? I think this came up in map overflow and, and elicited many, many responses, uh, most of them quite, quite good, a very nice one by Min Young Kim. Uh, I don't think a conclusion was reached about what makes a diophantic equation interesting, but, but if somehow it, it leads to hard mathematics, that was interesting to some people. Now, the question, of course, of a diophantic equation uh, re apparently requires hard mathematics to solve it, and then is solved later by, say, similar triangles. Was it interesting to begin with? <laughs> Difficult to tell. So, uh, so we'll see some of the some of the things that come out of this. But again, I just sort of a very technical point here, or, or a simple point. Uh, of course, if you if you had a solution, you could scale uh, by just multiplying through by sufficiently many powers of twos and p's to get new solutions. And so we can have a notion of a primitive solution, and it's, you don't need to read this, it's just this. You can sort of assume you have a primitive solution. It could satisfy these uh, things in the, in the display equation that's not numbered there. And, and it's easy to check that that, that is really the right, uh, the right definition you want to you look at. So again, really what we're looking at is, is these S integral points on, on these particular E sub p and E sub 2p. Uh, where S is just this, this small set. Okay. So, again, yet another sort of rambling aside. If you, if you look at uh, elliptic curves given in a sort of quartic model, then there really are lots of examples where, where you can actually uniformly bound the number of solutions to the, the corresponding equation, or if you like the number of integral points on in that model, uh, independent of the parameters. So, and that's very standard for quartic models and extremely non-standard to the point of no single example known for, for cubic models. So it's, a, it's, an, it's an odd situation that cubic models are in some sense pretty, tri uh, pretty tricky comparatively. And this case I'm looking at here is maybe the simplest case. So full rational two torsion are cubic models that one will be quartic models. So, okay, back to this thing. So we can go and look for some solutions, and we can just do a little search in a box. And you find, say, these. Okay. And these, again, we, we always have A, well, if A is given, then B equals 1. So there's a, there's a blob of models. And then if you stare at the problem a little bit harder, you find some families of solutions. So you find solutions corresponding to every prime that fits into one of these equations. So the first one are just primes that are that are sums of two fourth powers, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, down there. So there's primes that show up in in, at, in powers in particular recurrent sequences. This one or here, usually primes are that are a very particular shape. Okay. So. You, you find these, and, and maybe it's not so obvious that you find these, but, but you can check. In each of these cases, I can actually give you the, the x and the y, so you actually have solutions corresponding to each of these. So this is, this, the, these all show up. And the punchline is that that's it. That those are all the solutions. So really, if, you, if I give you a problem, you want to find these things, you can just pretty much do it by table lookup. You don't actually want to go computing units in, in quartic fields for any obvious reason. So that's it, and, and really, I'll, I'll go back. So what took me six years was actually, there used to be a b in the exponent here. It's p to the 2b plus 6p to the b. And it took me six years to, to uh, commit the typographical error of removing it. Uh, in any case, it is, it, is now, it is now gone. And in each of these cases here, each of these families, 
that we have b equals 1. So in fact, we have, for primitive solutions, b is always 1. Okay. And a sort of slightly cute corollary to that, if you go back and look at that, which I, which I can give to you, it may be not entirely obvious from these, but if you go and look at these things, uh, every single prime that can show up here is plus or minus 1 mod 8. That ranges from obvious to pretty much not obvious, but it's true for all of these. And the sort of thing that uh, first course in undergrad number theory, you would prove it for any one of these. So all of those primes are plus or minus 1 mod 8. So in particular, they're not plus or minus 3 mod 8. And so outside of some of those sporadic ones one had at the start, one had that list with 3s and 29s, outside of those, what we have is that there are no, there, there's never a non-torsion non integral point on any of these curves. And where that's, where that's again, mildly interesting, and this goes back to the, the question already Cohen asked me, is that if you take, say, n to be 2p, where p is 3 mod 8, then that's always a congruent number. So in particular, those always have infinitely many rational points, and this says they have no integral points other than the obvious ones that we can't really avoid, the, the torsion. Okay. And similarly, just for p5 mod 8. So, and then one can take that classification and just stare at it hard, and you can actually get sort of sharp bounds upon how many integral points you can have for these things. Uh, and again, this, 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 this wouldn't be surprising because, again, we're restricting the, uh, the bad reduction so, so tightly, but the number of, of S integral points even on, on EP or E sub 2P would be 9 or 19 respectively, and, and, and these are sharp. So for, for E sub 14, you've got exactly 17 S integral points on So I just want to stare a little bit at these families. So this is uh, something that, that worked out with the help of Greg Martin. If you uh, uh, conjecturally now, now of course, it was a beautiful paper of uh, a Friedlander and Evanyets to show that if you look at r to the fourth plus say t squared, then that actually get well. What was the title of it? It, it gets its primes, captures, captures. captures its primes. So that one, you can actually write down asymptotically how many primes are represented by that particular polynomial. Uh, so that one you can think of as a, I mean, so it's, it's pretty easy, and it goes back to Gauss, as the rep, how many primes are in the form, say, x squared plus y squared. Uh, and then Friedlander van Eyck, this is, this is pretty state-of-the-art stuff to get, if you like, x to the fourth plus y squared. And really what we'd like to get is something like, you know, x squared plus 1, but that's really out there. Here, this is even beyond uh, limitations of SID methods right now. I mean, sums of two fourth powers, but having said that, we can basically uh, model a heuristic on, on sort of heuristics of Bateman horn for this kind of thing and actually get this thing. I've weighted it with a log p, the counting function. You, you really might say, well, hell, I really what I want to have is, is how many primes there are up to, up to n of this, but it's a little bit cleaner if I weight it with a log p. And you say, we well, expect it to be this, where it's this very particular constant. And you have, to, you have to stare at it pretty hard to see that it is that. But if you do this up to uh, n equals 10 to the 16, uh, it, it fits this incredibly well. I'll show you a little bit of data in a second. So there's that particular constant. So this is for that very first family. There's actually, this basically says there's something like root n over log n of those primes up to, up to the constant n. Okay? And... Similarly, so there's other two. There are these three quartic forms that show up. So any prime represented by, by these forms. And interestingly enough, it's not, I don't think it's really obvious unless you stare hard at it. We expect the number of primes represented by r to the fourth plus s to the fourth to be basically the same. They're not the same primes, but the number of primes is the same as represented by this form, r to the fourth plus 12 r squared s squared plus 4 s to the fourth. So these really are... This is exactly the same as the previous one, and this one is the same but with a root 2 in the denominator. So it's, it's not obvious, it wasn't obvious to me when I worked this through that, that this should be the case. But, um, and for the remaining families, well, for two of them, we actually have heuristics that they, they should be finite. And this is stuff where we get into it, it, it very deep waters if you're trying to prove anything, because asking to prove that there are finitely many, or for that matter, infinitely many primes in, say, a binary recurrence sequence is pretty much way beyond uh, this, the current state of technology. You have uh, reasons to believe 
you don't have reasons not to believe that these things should have influenced many primes. In it. So in your mind, but you have to be careful. It, these are subtle kind of heuristics because you could say, you think they're infinitely many primes of the form two to the n minus one. And the conjecture, if you work it out, is well, yes. But having said that, to be prime of the form two to the n minus one, the n has to be prime. But even with that, your conjecture is that you have infinitely many mere n primes. But if you just say, well, density arguments, two to the n minus one, two to the n plus one, should be the same. But our expectation is that there's only finite many of the primes of the form two to the n plus one. So fair amount of primes. So there's some subtleties here, but in any case, so two of these families, we expect there to be actually finitely many primes. We expect, in fact, there to be just these. And for these other remaining families, we expect them all to be infinite. And this is all, again, things we can't prove any much. We can prove upper bounds, very easy upper bounds on the number of primes of this shape. But they're pretty much the same upper bounds we prove upon the number of integers of this shape. <laughs> the primality doesn't help us much here. <laughs> okay. So th but this at least means if we're counting for, for all of these ones, without working too hard, if we're counting them up to, e up to n, there's only root n. That's, that, that's a really easy bound. Probably with a tiny bit of work, I think Greg would back this up on sitting, you could get root n over log n. As an upper bound on the number of primes up to, x, up to, up to n, for which there are non-trivial integral points on these curves. So in other words, asymptotic density is zero among the primes. So you pick a random prime, there's no integral points on these congruent number curves corresponding to this other than uh, ones with y equals zero. And that, that's true. This is the worst table I could put together, but it's, uh, I think we heard this already in the first talk, that, that the limitations of the slide meant I couldn't actually put the label on here. So, so there's a large collection of data with no label. Uh, <laughs> but let me tell you what, what they're meant to be. So these are actually the eight. These, these are counting down, these are the, uh, the eight families of, of, of primes, and these are the number of primes in the family up to the bound that runs along the top here. So what you've actually got here, the first three of these give you an idea, this is where the, the, the meat of the stuff is. These are these three quartic forms, and they really do represent stuff, and all these other ones are bounded by logs, right? They're, these are these are coming out of binary current sequences. And my claim, though it's pretty hard to justify from here, is that this three and this three will keep going. But these two are finite, and my claim, which takes a little bit used to, is that this is going to infinity. <laughs> this is bounded, of course. You can see from the data. Uh, and similarly for these ones. But these are interesting here, and, and you'll notice if you're paying attention at the home, the home game that the, the quotient here and here is basically root two. And the, the agreement of the data is pretty pretty nice, but uh, but anyway, I won't, we, we can't prove anything. Okay. So, so these again, this is what's going on. So this, it's a classification that lets you, lets you do some stuff. And let me just show, I'll show you a really easy case in the descent and then a slightly more subtle one and then we'll get to the, the new stuff. Because we're now in the, the section that says old stuff. So again, it, you know, the, the descent is trivial and you could, you could, you could have a, a high school student do it. Uh, just the problem is sort of polishing stuff up. But you look at the particular cases here, we're dealing with different cases about A's relative to B's and whether, how, which powers of 2 and P divide the X's, et cetera, et cetera. But if you take this particular case here as an example, uh, then you could trace it through, okay, and you end up with the situation at the bottom here. You end up getting uh, a situation where 2 to the A times P is showing up here, so we've actually got a fourth power minus this thing times the square equals one. So what we've got, if you like, is we're going into the Pell sequence, a recurrent sequence corresponding to two to the a times p. So we're working q joint in, in root two to the a p, and we're finding a square in, in the sort of corresponding Lucas sequence, the, the, for the, where the c, c to the fourth is there. And these are things that are quite well understood. And in fact, this can only happen for c is for positive C being 3, 7, and 99. And this was proved a long time ago by Bordell, and it's essentially elementary. This is the sort of thing you could realistically uh, do in a, an undergraduate course. <laughs> I don't think you would, but you could. <laughs> okay. So, just to give you another example, so again, we're looking at these different cases and you do very simple descent and you just see what you get. So here, we factor this thing out, we cancel out stuff, 
and we end up getting sort of this last row. We've got three factors whose product is a square, and one of the cases that can occur is, is of course, that the first factor is minus a square, and then similarly for the second and third factor. You can just verify that product is, of course, a square. And if you have that, you manipulate this, and you end up with that there thing, this particular quartic form, and we saw that before. This is this is one of our, our, our three quartic forms where we're counting the primes represented by that. But we have to take care of the case that that's actually prime power. Okay, and with a little bit of manipulation, we end up with the slightly simpler equation down the bottom, which is that a fourth power plus a square is well, it's more than a, just a prime power. It's an even prime power. The frustrating thing is it didn't seem to be any easier to solve that equation, where we're looking, if you like, to solve x squared, x to the fourth plus y squared equals p to the 2n, seemed to be no easier to solve than solving x to the fourth plus y squared equals z to the n, without using anything that n is even or that x is a prime, prime power. It didn't seem that that extra apparently large amount of information was helpful at all. And so, uh, similarly, the other ones that, that lead to these quartic forms lead to similar diophantic equations. So we have, again, a fourth power plus a square is a, is a prime power, and a fourth power plus twice a square is a prime power. And this was sort of an excuse for, for this paper I wrote with, uh, with Nathan Ng and, and Jordan Ellenberg, was to actually try to, to, to try to solve these. So Jordan had already done most of the work, it must be confessed, uh, by essentially solving the first of these equations, a to the fourth plus b squared equals c to the q, now, he'd solve this for all prime q greater or equal to 211. And he'd done this by basically writing down a Fry curve. And where this comes from, well, it actually most obviously comes from doing the same thing with the plus replaced by minus and then, and then replacing one of the variables by i times the variable. That probably isn't very helpful, but if you work in this, in this game, the a to the fourth minus b squared one was, was something to be studied quite a bit because that leads to one that's uh, a curve that's actually has coefficients over the rationals, whereas this one is actually a Q curve. It's a Q curve and the coefficients are in a number field, but the, the corresponding curve we're looking at has the property that it wants to be rational. It wants to be rational in the sense that all its Galois conjugates are isogenous to it. Okay? And so, similarly, we can do something similar, but over, over again, Q join root minus two for the second equation. And with some work, you can show that, that the usual kind of wildsy machinery goes through nicely here, that we actually have <coughs> modularity. So interestingly enough, when you, when you play this game, if you, if you look at the, the proof of Fermat's last theorem, the hard stuff, the, the last stuff was the modularity. The easiest stuff, to some degree, and it's again, as you said, using the term easy loosely, was the Mazur stuff. And that's what you use to show that your corresponding representations are reducible. But that was the, the oldest stuff, and then you've got ribbit sort of in between. And when you start to work with Q-curves, or when you go to work with Hilbert modular forms, the sort of level of difficulty these things kind of get shuffled sometimes. That, at, at here, it's really the, the analog of the Mazur results that's a hard one to find. The modularity was something that came not very long after Wiles. And the level lowering was something that was there before, because ribbit's level lowering arguments are actually quite, quite general. But the hard bit, was actually, and this is why initially Jordan had this bound Q greater equal 211, the hard bit was actually getting the analog of Mazur's theorem. We're getting something to actually show that the representations are irreducible so that you can apply rid of it. Uh, but okay, but we did that. It's basically, this is an exercise in, as the Dutch say, an exercise in coaster mania. So this is a just straight analytic, analytic number theory of, of that particular flavor, if you're interested. So, Let's, uh, now again, there are all these cases, and I had treated all of these some years ago, it must be said. Uh, this paper, strangely enough, was the, the excuse for doing this paper with, with Jordan and Nathan. Uh, but this had caused me trouble. So let's look at a particular example that could happen. So one thing you could have is this. You've got the product of these three things being a square. That's how it could work out. There's nothing to stop that. And if you play around with this, not entirely obvious that that's true. You play around with this by saying, what do I want to do? Uh, I'll subtract the x from the x minus plus 2p to the b, and I get twice 
bracket c squared minus 4 e squared, and I'll factor that. So I have c minus 2e, c plus 2e is going to be p to the b, and, and one of them has to be minus 1, and one of them has to be p to the b, basically. So you put that together, you end up with this equation here. And this equation troubled me for many years, uh, and I want to tell you how we have gone about solving it. So this is an example of a super elliptic equation. Uh, even, so again, we solve it sort of independent of the fact that the variable is prime, p. So again, you know, when b equals 1, there's definitely many solutions to this. Well, not necessarily with, with, with a prime p, but if you replace p by a variable x, there's definitely many solutions. Again, this is just a, it's just a genus, genus like a Powell equation. Uh, but for a larger one, this is a super elliptic equation, and, and it's been long known that you can use uh, lower bounds for linear forms and complex logarithms to get an absolute bound upon everything involved there, p, b, and d. Uh, but this is one of those ones that doesn't look too pretty. It's sort of something like e to the e to the e to the e to the thousand, if you just apply the theorem of that thing. So the hard work is to try to get that down to something manageable. So we can look at that. We can first, so I, I threw away the minus sign. Just the, because I don't like writing. Oh, it's appeared again here. But anyway, um, so we can rewrite this. And so, so another way of looking at this at this equation is to say I want to have. I, so this is a given recurrence sequence. You're looking at, at y squared minus two z squared. Sorry, z squared uh, is minus one. And we're looking for a particular shape of beast to show up there in the z. And in general, this kind of problem is something that's effectively computable, but maybe not really beautiful. So let me show you how you do that. So in any case, we've got that this, this thing is a, is, is, is a unit, and so we get this representation here. So epsilon here is, is fundamental unit in q is on root 2. OK? Uh, but we can also rewrite it this way. This is not so obvious, but what I've done is just put a minus x to the n on the right-hand side. It's not so obvious why you do that. And said, okay, this thing is a this thing is an nth power, so I'll factor it in q join root two, and it basically means that the factors is an nth power up, up to units. Okay. So if you do that, we've got these two equations. Again, it's not so obvious why you do that, but now multiply the first one by root two and subtract the second one. And you get rather implausibly, you get one. <coughs> so, and the reason one might do that is if you just look at that first equation, there's no obvious way to go from there. Or if you look at the original equation we're dealing with, there's no obvious way to go from that to a Fry curve. Fry curves are pretty easy to write down, in many cases at least, when you've got a ternary equation. But we had four terms to start with, a prior up. And so it just didn't seem the way to do this. But we've done it, but we have to go outside Q. So here, again, epsilon is, is 1 plus root 2. So now we have something which is, in some odd sense, it's a, it's a two-way equation over Q join root 2. Okay. Uh, so n here is a, it's going to be test fixed. Uh, let's just. Go back to what we had before. So this is again just representing the fact that, that this thing, uh, this thing was a unit. So if we do this, then we can write that first chunk there. We can we can write that as epsilon to the k plus epsilon to the minus k over two root two, and we can just manipulate this. And it follows then that this particular lambda, this is a linear form in logarithms, has to be small. Okay. The main reason you have that is you just subtract is you've got you've got that x to the n is basically root two times epsilon to the k because epsilon to the minus k is something that's going to zero exponentially. Okay. So that linear form has to be small. And again, these are epsilon one plus root two. So we've got the only unknowns are the k, the n, and the and the x. And we can apply lower bounds for linear forms of logarithms. I will spare you the details, but with a large amount of, of work, 
you can get down to a bound of the shape roughly and bounded by 10 to the 8. Okay? And so that's, in some sense, then telling us then, so n is now bounded by 10 to the 8. And so, and for each smaller value of n, this is now uh, a hyperlyptic curve. And we have, again, absolute bounds upon x and y for this sort of equation. Again, violating forms and logs, unfortunately, they're huge. They really are still like e to the e to the thousand. But we're not done yet. So what we're going to do here is write down a Fry curve. Now, this is, it may seem like a very simple situation, but it's a little bit more complicated in some abstract sense than what we were looking at before. So in that case, we we're looking at Q-curves. And Q-curves are quite well understood. We have modularity to, 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 in the same way that we do for curves over Q. Okay, we have connection to, to, to a modular form in a particular way. Now, this thing is not a Q-curve. So this is not isogenous to its Galois conjugate. Okay. But we can still work through and, and find out information about it. So we have a minimal discriminant, the conductor. And we can look at uh, the representation on the absolute Galois group like this. So again, this is fixed P. It's possible that my P here is my, was my N earlier, but uh, apologies for that. And we can use recent arguments of Freitas. And this, is, this gets us around what was one of our sticky points to actually show that this representation is absolutely irreducible. So I'm hiding a great deal here. Okay. And we can actually apply sort of modu basic modularity machinery to show that it's actually modular. level lower. So we have connection between our representation and analogous one for some parallel weight Hilbert modular form over k here is 2 join root 2. We've got the level uh, given here and this is something that we can actually compute. Okay. So we can go and look at the things at this level m and we find that we actually have an 8 dimensional space. Now, we can actually go then and look by brute force for elliptic curves over Q join root 2 that have the same conductor. And by probably nothing is coincidence in this game, luckily for us, we find eight of them that are non-isogenous. They're also modular, and so they have to actually match up. So we're sort of lucky here. We got eight-dimensional space, and we found the eight bits in some sense. And these are the curves. Okay. So we have this again. This is this making it more sort of concrete. We actually have uh, so again. These are the f's. The, I'm going to stay here. The E's were, uh, were our, from our Fry curves. So we actually have these sort of Fourier co coefficients matching up. And that's just a sort of statement here. This is analogous to the good and bad reduction cases you get in Weil's results. And one can actually uh, work rather carefully here. So now we actually have, so we have this matching up Fourier coefficients. We can actually compute them locally from our Fry curve and say, OK, well, what form could it be? So we could match them up carefully here, just working locally. And we can actually use this to show that k, so the exponent here, has to be either plus or minus 1 mod some fairly large number. And the only thing it could be, so we can rule out all the other cases, uh, is either we're corresponding to minus 1 and we're hitting f2, or corresponding to plus 1 and we're hitting f7. And this really is just coming from the fact that if you just write down the Fry group, E11, E1 minus 1 is F2. And E11 is F7. And this sort of shows you very explicitly that these are the Galois conjugates of each other, and they're non-isogenous. So you're definitely not in a sort of Fry curve situation. 
So this lets us get to the end game here. So, so the, the problem again, the situation, we're, we're trying to solve this thing. We've got a bound on n, which I think I've called p at least once in this talk. We bounded this by, say, 10 to the 8. And that gives us bounds on everything else, but they're horrible. They're absolutely enormous bounds. So we need to get that bound down. So if we continue this sort of sieve, and I, I haven't told you any of the details of it, but we're sieving using the fact that we actually know the Fourier coefficients corresponding to these modular forms, uh, these, these code modular forms, then we're able to actually get congruences upon k and l. We're able to show that they're both one mod n. In fact, they're one mod something quite large. And so this thing, which a priori you have this large sort of family of two equations depending upon k and l, we can actually take powers of epsilon and hide them. So we can take powers of epsilon and move them into something we'll call x and something we'll call y, and we end up really with just this two equations. It's very straightforward that we're trying to solve over q adjoined root 2. Z adjoined root 2, really. Okay. So we really have just this. And the nice thing here is that we now reduce, I mean, it's maybe only nice if you're sort of an expert in, in, in the area, but we reduce to a linear form in two logarithms. Because if we have this equation holding for x and y large, then that tells you that, that basically n log y over x is basically a half log 2. So the difference is very, very small. I agree. Linear forms of logs does that to kids. <laughs> but so it tells you it tells you that that particular logarithm, and that's a linear form of two logarithms. And, and you have to have played this game to appreciate this, but linear forms in three logarithms, the bounds that come out are awful. And if you can somehow get the linear forms in two, they become good. So if we just apply off the shelf linear form two logarithms, you get the bound down to under a thousand. Okay, but solving two equations of degree a thousand can be very, very hard because you typically have to compute the unit group or at least a set of independent units and if you're a degree a thousand, that is not going to happen. So maybe by brute force you can get up to degree 40 or something like that in that neighborhood, but, but not to here. But what we can do is something that's a bit like sort of Mordell's a sieve, where well, what we, what we end up doing here is we sieve like crazy. We sieve to basically say, so what happens with this equation? We have to stare at it a bit. This thing has a solution. It has a solution with, with k equals 1 and l equals 1 and alpha equals 1. Right? Root 2 times 1 plus root 2 minus 1 plus root 2 is 1. Okay? So that's the solution. And that's really the only solution. So that's what you have with Diophant equations. You tend to have, if, if there are finally many solutions, you tend to, well, if you, and you're trying to show it, sometimes what can get in the way, and that's what's happening here, is that there's an obstruction, there's a Hilbert modular form, there really is one there corresponding to this trivial solution. But what you can do with that thing is you can basically stare hard at that, work locally, and show that, okay, I can't a priori show there's no more solutions, but I can show that if there is one, it looks a heck of a lot like the one I know. So you end up showing that if there is another solution, it looks like the one with k equals l equals 1. In particular, you end up showing that k is 1 mod a lot. So you work locally for a bunch of different primes, you show it's 1 mod p for all the primes up to some very large bound, and that gets you the k is 1 mod, say, e to the 10,000. That's not hard to do, because we work for each prime. There's not that many primes to get, to get that their product is bigger than e to the 10,000. So we get that, but, but that tells us that the x is bigger than this e to the e to the 10,000. And as crazy as the bounds you get out of Baker theory are for two equations, they're not that bad. They're, they're close to that bad. We had to go that far, but that's about how far we had to go. So what this proves then is that either k really is 1, in which case we're done, or it's huge. And that means x is so huge we get a contradiction. And hence we conclude that k really was 1. And so the only solutions we have are the trivial. And I'll stop there.